Thank you all so much. Um, thank you so much for spending some time with us this afternoon, this afternoon in Paris. It might be morning with you or the evening. Um, but thank you so much um, for spending some time. Um, my name is Anthony Mann. I'm a senior policy analyst here at the Kennedy OECD. And um, I lead the team which does work here on career readiness, um, helping, uh, <laughs> we're working on how we can help schools to help students to um, prepare as, as well as possible um, to do well in the labour market once they leave education. And um, the problem which, you know, which we're focused on is the one which I think is, is going to be shared by pretty much everybody in this, this virtual room, which is that there's very deep concern that young people, even though they're um, on average, more highly qualified than any generation in history, are struggling in the labour market. And we kind of saw that before the pandemic. But now with the pandemic, we see um, a much higher degree of turbulence um, in terms of the jobs market, in terms of increasing demand, some areas, rapidly falling demands in other areas. It's going to be a while before we see how things play out. We're also sort of like um, um, in many, many countries, perhaps every country, expecting an economic contraction, a recession. Um, huge amounts of money have been spent on the pandemic and the concern that you know kind of that we have um, uh, as um, we have at the OECD is that we're going to see a, a rep repetition I'm just sharing my screen here a repetition of what happened in the great financial crisis now um, in the great financial crisis of um, kind of 2007 2008 um, what we saw was um, uh, a, a very significant um, um, you know, kind of reduction in economic activity. Um, we saw governments having to bail out banks and other institutions. We saw contractions of government spending. And we saw a recession which lasted, you know, so many years. And what you've got here is youth unemployment levels. So these are people um, under the age of 24 who are young um, and um, out of work. And the percentage of young people who are out of work in 2007 and 2010. And we kind of see, you know, across this selection of countries where the, uh, you know, the, uh, let me just close this one down, where the, uh, um, the, um, the, the kind of great financial crisis was particularly sort of like severe, you know, really sort of like significant increases in youth unemployment. And the thing is that you know, these increases in youth unemployment are much higher for young people than they are for older people. And we kind of see sort of like in most countries in general, even though young people are cheaper, often they're sort of like much more highly educated, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're, you know, they're not, they, they face higher levels of unemployment than older workers. And, you know, kind of the theory really is, is that, you know, they've got less know-how about having to find a job. They've got fewer contacts because most people find jobs through other people they know. And they've got less experience, you know, so they're less able to be able to kind of persuade, um, um, sort of, you know, potential employers that they're a safe bet. And so we kind of see here, you know, kind of this massive increase in youth unemployment. Um, but just pick out, you know, sort of Germany over here. You know, so in Germany, we actually see a fall. And people will be very aware of the strength of the German vocational system. But also Germany's got a very good career guidance system. You know, it necessarily has a good career guidance system because, you know, a lot of young people are making decisions about whether they're going to go into apprenticeships in particular areas at the ages of 14, 15, 16, you know, big numbers. And, you know, we kind of see areas here where, you know, we've got a strong apprenticeship system, you know, got employers still continue to signal where there's, you know, there, there, there are employment opportunities there. Young people are, are changing the, the skills acclimation, which they get accumulation, which they get as they go into the labor market. Um, but our focus here is not sort of like, um, you know, on the detail of this economic um, kind of scenario. Our, our focus really is on what schools can do. This is designed to be a pretty practical session um, sharing insights from um, kind of research, um, from uh, kind of kind of people from kind of like around the world. Our focus is on you know what can schools do to try and prevent these sorts of levels of um, kind of unemployment. You know what are they able to do? Um, you know and how can they equip young people to be um, uh, you know better equipped you know, to be able to withstand you know, this difficult labour market. And even before the pandemic, we were worried. You know, us and other international organizations are very worried because look at the data and the data tells us that um, you know young people typically you know they have when they when we find out about their career thinking it's often very narrow and um, it's often confused and distorted distorted by the social backgrounds here you see just briefly um, a, a chart on what we call career concentration so in our PISA surveys which and more than half a million students from around the world complete every three years. We asked them, what job do you expect to do at age 30? 
And then we kind of put together, you know, the percentage, which say just one of 10 jobs, the most popular 10 jobs. And you'll kind of see here that, you know, that on average across, um, across the kind of OECD, it's about 45%. This is all students. If we did just girls and boys, it'd be higher. Um, but, you know, really high percentages of kids are saying they're going to be working in just a few jobs. In Saudi Arabia, a third of girls say they're going to be a doctor. And that tells us something about labor market signaling, about how poor the labor market is signaling and how narrow young people's decisions are. It's thinking is as they go forward. So that's a concern for us. But also we have another complicated table for you. Um, concerns that not only are other ambitions tend to be very narrow, but also, you know, there's evidence to show they're confused and distorted by social background. Now, this chart here, it's got a lot of information. Let me just talk you through it. These figures down here at the bottom, they tell us the percentage of kids who have a career ambition, whose ambition is to be either a manager or a professional. You know? So, you know, people might be aware that the ILO has this mechanism of classifying jobs, it's called ISCO, the International Standard Classification of, of Occupations. And, you know, as a part of this, we can, you know, they tell us what job they're interested in, we classify it. And so, you know, a really ambitious sort of like generation. But very many young people, you know, don't recognize that they're probably gonna to have to go to university to be able to get a job like that. And so when they, when they underestimate, you know, the education they need to achieve their occupational ambition, we call them misaligned, or they're underestimating it. It's a signal that they're confused about what they need to do. And you'll see here is that, you know, kind of the, the blocks at the bottom here are kids from the most advantaged, sort of like students. We kind of classify kids by their social background, who's the most advantaged quarter of students. And the ones up here, the most disadvantaged. And so we see quite a lot of confusion here amongst kids about you know, what they need to do in order to be able to achieve an ambition, which might be quite narrow and anyway and difficult to achieve. But also, you know, social background really gets in the way. So these are concerns for us before we even start. And then if we look at some of the latest results from PISA 2018, we kind of find across um, you know, the selection of countries, um, you know, what percentage of 15 year olds have actually spoken to a career counselor in school by the age of 15? Well, you know, for the OECD, on average, it's 50 percent. Half of them haven't. And, you know, kids are making all sorts of important decisions by the time they get to that point. You're all aware of this, about the importance of the decisions which they're making, about their investment in education, about how hard they try, about what subjects they choose to study, how they narrow their focus. Um, you know, many, in many countries, they can be going directly into the labor market, 15, 16. And then, you know, we look at just one example as well of, you know, have they been to a job, jobs fair? A really simple thing for us you know, to do, a really important thing to do in order to be able to make sure that young people have an opportunity to engage with employers and, and ask them first-hand questions about, you know, what's an offer. And we find here that, you know, our, our OSD average is, you know, less than 40%. In many countries, young people haven't. So there are concerns for us which are which are great before the pandemic and are still sort of like in a kind of like very significant today. So let me just stop sharing now and also go back. Um, and so this is an ask the expert, expert um, you know, session. Um, we are very very happy that we have two uh, probably the most world's most influential experts today. Um, we have uh, Deirdre Hughes, who you'll be hearing from a bit later on. I'm going to tell you a bit about Deirdre's background um, a bit later on in the webinar. But firstly, we have uh, David Bluestein. David is um, in a kind of uh, a um, one, of, one, of, one of kind of the key thinkers, I think, in this field about the psychology of work and young people's preparation for work. And over the next 90 minutes, you're going to be hearing um, um, you're going to be hearing David and Deirdre and myself as well talking, you know, answering some of the questions which we've had already. Um, there may be other questions which you want to ask as you're going through. Um, put them in the chat function. Um, um, we have um, so Catalina and John from my team who are going to be monitoring that. And Catalina is going to be sort of like joining the discussion a bit later on with any questions and observations that people might have. Um, so please, you know, kind of, you know, uh, plan on doing that. Um, across this kind of virtual world, we've got people from more than 20 different countries. Um, I mean, I think our circumstances will all be very different, but our objective is all the same. We want young people to be able to go into, you know, to leave education and go into the working world with a sense of choice and a sense of confidence. And that's what we're really focused on, you know. Um, you know, as one of, uh, as Reza, you know, um, hello Reza from Pakistan asked us, you know, kind of what are the resources that the careers community can provide to schools in the pandemic to enable this kind of choice and confidence? So let's kick off. Uh, I'm gonna start with int intervention from, from David. 
Uh, David is a professor in the Department of Counseling and Education Psychology at Boston College in the United States. Um, he's the author of two really important books, uh, as well as many, many others, like articles and um, um, book chapters, um, The Psychology of Working. And just a couple of years ago, um, The Importance of Work in an Age of Uncertainty. Couldn't recommend them highly enough. Um, David also trains career counsellors at his university and is a practicing counsellor himself. Uh, so, David, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions from the questions which you've had already, you know, as people are registering, um, and then I'll hand things over to you. Uh, firstly, uh, Natalie, or Natalie in France, asks, how do social and emotional skills influence students' careers, career expectations and choices? Uh, and Jacob in Sweden asks, what schools can do to help build the, the psychological resiliency of young people? So there's a, there's a couple of things to kind of to dwell on. Um, David. Sure, so I'll, I'll provide some brief responses to both of those questions. And then my presentation will go into a bit more depth. Um, the social, social and emotional skills that are discussed a lot these days in schools are really critical for the workforce. They're critical in terms of how people will get along at work. And we know that relational skills are essential to succeed in the workforce of this, of this particular moment in our lives. Um, but I'm also going to talk about the social and emotional skills that affect young people as they, as they confront a, um, a crisis, the likes of which we have not seen in decades. <clears throat> the crisis of moving out in this pandemic world into the workforce, which has really shut the door for many, many of them. And um, when I speak a little bit later, I will talk a little bit about some specific ways to foster social and emotional uh, adapti adaptiveness that will help people to manage the situation better. Now, the second question was about um, special education students, right? The SEND, the SEND acronym, which was new to me, actually. We don't use that in the US. Maybe I could introduce it and get credit for it. No. Um, so the, um, the needs of students with dis disabling conditions <clears throat> are complex. One of the things I've learned in research that I've been doing, and I also have been kind of involved in this research for years. In fact, I just uh, completed a study with my niece, who's a professor at Texas, um, Texas A&M. And we did a study of, um, we did a qualitative study of, of youth who have already left or on the verge of leaving school, going into the, into the world of work. These were primarily youth with some intellectual disabilities. Um, and what we found, it was actually a study that was modeled after my book, The Importance of Work in an Age of Uncertainty. My niece and her colleagues and myself, we used basically the same interview protocol. And what we found is, is that the young people want a life of meaning and purpose at work. And I know there's been some debate about this, um, but the, the reality is people do want to work. Now their needs for work may be somewhat different, um, they might have financial support based on social service um, um, payments from their, from their home country. They may not. But the desire to, to be creative and to contribute is, is there, and it's there often in a very powerful way, uh, as is the desire to relate to others, to have that, the social relationships at work, and to feel a sense of accomplishment and purpose. So I think the challenges that students face with disabling conditions are gonna be daunting in this period where a lot of the jobs that they have taken in the past are becoming automated. I think it's gonna be up to us as a society to make sure that we center these students and not put them at the back of the bus. It will require more intentionality on the part of schools and systems to create decent work for students with disabling conditions. So Anthony, would you like me to go on to my presentation now? Yes, okay. Okay, so let me, um, let me get this set up here. Okay, slideshow. I'm gonna to speak today about psychological resilience in the pandemic with a focus on youth unemployment. And I'm not gonna, I don't have a lot of uh, text. I just wanna kind of cover some of the main issues and focus on a few specific takeaways for you. Uh, on the right here is a picture of my university, Boston College. It's a lovely university, uh, Jesuit University. And I was telling my colleagues, I've only been there once since March, um, been doing all my work remotely. So I do miss that beautiful campus. So um, 
the, the transition is daunting enough for students, the transition from school into work or to post-secondary training or university, already a scary kind of transition. Um, the pandemic has created a sense of there being a vacuum on the other side. And uh, so the question to ask ourselves is, what is this feeling like for our young people? What does it feel like to face a world where there's no exit, where there's just no way out? I've included here this uh, song lyric, I've got nowhere to run and I've got nowhere to go. Um, it's from a song called Born in the USA by Bruce Springsteen. If you read my book, she'll know I like Bruce Springsteen a lot. Um, and the song Born in the USA was always misinterpreted. Some people thought it was a jingoistic, ultra patriotic song. Um, actually not. It's a song about um, how youth face very difficult circumstances. And in this case, the, narr the, the narrator ended up um, going to Vietnam and struggled terribly. And this was a real cry for help of this particular protagonist in this song. Anthony, did you have a quick question? Oh, no, okay. Um, perhaps you'd like the Bruce Springsteen reference. Um, so <clears throat> the growth in unemployment, I think Anthony has touched on that uh, well, but I do wanna cover a few points that I, I picked up in reviewing a report by the ILO. This report by the ILO was, was the research that was done in the first two or three months of the pandemic. And even at that point, the data was startling and really stunning. One in six people who were employed, young people from 18 to 24 who were employed, lost their jobs. This, by the way, was a survey of, of uh, young people from 18 to 24 in 112 countries. Working hours fell by 25%. And even at this point, the mental health issues were rising dramatically. And there was some data in the report indicating that up to 25% of young people had anxiety and depression that they didn't report prior to the pandemic. So this is an important piece that I'm gonna to try to weave into this. As a psychologist, I have training in mental health as well as work-based issues, career development. So I'm gonna weave in a bit on the mental health issues and kind of help us think about ways that we could provide some prevention for students. So the issue of the psychological impact of unemployment, there's a lot of research on this and the, and the findings are solid and, and are replicable across many contexts. Being unemployed for a long period of time, usually six months or longer, is causally predictive of mental health problems. Actually to the tune of double the amount of mental health problems that, that would occur ordinarily. In a meta-analysis that, that a lot of us cite from 2009, it was before the pandemic and before the Great Recession, um, the data indicated that 32% of people unemployed more than, 16, more than six months did struggle from mental health problems. It's important to note that these mental health problems were not what we call, um, th these mental health problems were caused by the, by the recession, by the lo loss of work. And one of the best treatments for this kind of depression and anxiety was helping people get a new job, which puts our field of career guidance center stage in this issue. Um, another issue that comes up for unemployment for young people is this idea of potential scarring. It's a term used in developmental psychology. The notion is that if, if it's hard, if young people are having a difficult time of making entry into the world of work, there may be some long-term consequences. And some of the long-term consequences can include things like um, having difficulty moving into adult roles, having difficulty leaving the parental home, starting adult relationships, um, developing a career. And sadly, we see, as we've looked at these data across different recessions and depressions, we've seen these scarring effects going on throughout the lifespan. It's not a one-to-one -one correlation. So if you have family members who are unemployed, don't think, oh my God, is this person gonna be scarred? Not everyone goes through this. When we look at psychological data, we're looking at data that indicates that this is more likely than it would have been without this particular crisis. Um, also, we see a lot of alienation and disengagement, and I'm sure we all see it um, as we go out, if we can go out. Um, and going into the public squares and seeing a lot of young people hanging around in the streets. So what, what do we need to do? It's clear that systemic interventions are needed. It would be naive of me not to mention this, although I know that I'm speaking here primarily to people who are working with communities and individuals. We do need more jobs and we do need advocacy to help create a, um, a, a, a demand for more jobs. And um, 
I know people feel frustrated at this point. And I will say that as a, as a citizen of the US, and I'm, I know there's some Americans on this call that a lot of us were so, first of all, surprised that Donald Trump was defeated, even though like me, I desperately wanted it, but I feared it till the end that he would still stay in power. But what we're seeing in, in the Biden administration is this huge piece of legislation, the American Rescue Act, which will be probably the most profound piece of social and economic legislation. Some people think uh, the most profound piece of legislation going back to the Great Depression, and it will be creating jobs. Um, so that's certainly an important piece of what we need to do here. Um, and the question of what can schools do and I will be touching on this later, but schools can provide effective and flexible career guidance. <clears throat> and also we can work on as a profession providing more preventive interventions. And I'll be speaking about these preventive interventions in, my ne in the next few minutes here. So before we get to that, let's think about what, a, what does psychology tell us about the main sources of resilience for, for people facing the kind of a challenge that, that people face with unemployment. I'm gonna go over a few here and I'm gonna do a deeper dive into the first two. But critical consciousness is an important concept which I'll go over shortly. Psychological flexibility is another important concept um, which again, I'll go over. But social support is critical. Relational support is absolutely essential to help people feel less alone. Uh, we need to provide our young people with self opportunities for self-care. I know a lot of us see this when we're working with unemployed youth or working with unemployed adults that they often feel like they have to work 40 or 50 hours a week looking for a job. Well, they could probably be just as effective 25 or 30 hours a week and taking the rest of the time to work on other things, you know, exercise, learning a new language, um, continuing their training and education. Uh, another source of resilience is to, for people to be exploratory and planful. And that we know from decades and decades of career development research. Um, so let me speak about critical consciousness. This is a concept that I've been very interested in for over 20 years. Uh, in fact, it's mentioned extensively in my first book, the 2006 book that's up on the, on the screen, The Psychology of Working. Uh, the individual on the left is Paulo Freire, who is the brilliant Brazilian activist and pedagogical scholar who basically developed this idea in Brazil in the 1960s and 70s. Um, and this idea was that we can train people, we can educate people to, um, which I think I have, a, no, no, we can educate people to consider, not just read, but his, his task was to help people learn how to read. That was his charge in Brazil. He wanted to add to that, helping people learn how to read the world. That phrase perhaps defines critical consciousness better than anything else. Reading the world means to try to understand, to suss out what are the main systemic issues that may be playing a role in the, the struggles I'm having in life. The example we use, of course, is unemployment. This is a critical intervention for the unemployed. We know from research on unemployed people, both youth and adults, that they tend to blame themselves, particularly in countries where there's a strong emphasis on individual responsibility. So if the culture in your country is one of individual responsibility, which I think the US has, um, um, unfortunately, a very bad case of this. Um, we, we see that people do blame themselves. I've seen it in many, many sessions. I, my, my emphasis in my work had been working with long-term unemployed adults and youth, that the self-blame aspect was really, really painful for people. Critical consciousness helps to reduce the self-blame because people are then able to come up with a more accurate appraisal about the cause of unemployment which will not center the individual, but will center systemic factors, such as you know, the fact that we've had this pandemic. Pandemic wasn't something that we, that you as the individual caused, and society um, could be dealing with it better. There are countries that have dealt with this really well, that have provided resources for their unemployed um, populations, that provide training and support. Other countries have not, um, and that's, that's kind of a great, great example of critical consciousness. Another concept I want to bring up here is psychological flexibility. Um, I've recently become interested in ACT therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy. It's a, a model that's been developed by an American uh, psychologist, Stephen Hayes. And uh, it's been around for 40 years. And ACT, ACT therapy actually represents a blend of behavioral therapy, which actually in my own life was not my favorite type of therapy. Um, 
And I've kind of come back to it, even though I learned it as an undergrad, I've come back to it because the way Stephen Hayes has understood it and he has he's understood behavior therapy from an Eastern lens informed by meditation and mindfulness and by contemplative practice. And he's also understood um, the principles of, of cognitive behaviorism, cognitive behavioral therapy also through that lens. And um, I've just done a fair amount of reading on this in the last few months and looked at some of the research. And I think it's a very powerful tool that could be really helpful for us in career guidance. There are six pillars to what this, this concept of psychological flexibility. According to Stephen Hayes, psychological flexibility is the best predictor of coping with mental health problems. It's the best predictor of mitigating mental health problems and preventing them. So um, I'll just go over these six points quickly <clears throat> and you'll see things that will really resonate for you if you've been interested in meditation or mindfulness. We look at the top one, present moment awareness. Um, the one on the next to it, contact with values. This is the part that taps into the work we do in career guidance, which is helping people to develop this connection to things that are meaningful in their lives, which actually provides a very good distraction when people are struggling with some depression and anxiety. The next one here is committed action, um, which is actually based on self-determination theory, which I write a lot about in my own work. Self as context. This is a very important concept that actually differs a bit from some of the career guidance interventions. I actually just spoke to my friend Mark Zavikas about this particular idea a few days ago. And Hayes pushes back at the, what he calls the conceptualized self because he thinks those narrative stories that we tell ourselves often become um, a cage for us and don't allow us to pivot. His whole idea is to be able to pivot, and to be flexible and his self as context is not necessarily arguing that we should be completely compliant with whatever the environment demands, but that we have to have some degree of flexibility. This diffusion piece is one of the central parts of it. Diffusion is developing the capacity to diffuse yourself from an attachment to um, difficult thoughts, feelings, memories, um, emotional triggers. And he provides a lot of interventions to help people diffuse. And last but not least, and this is probably why it's called acceptance is the first term here, is to learn to accept that things don't always go that well. And when we accept, it doesn't mean that we're, we're giving up. He does uh, an etymology of these words and acceptance actually comes from a word about the person being able to receive a gift, to accept a gift. And the gift is the gift of the actual experience. And his idea is that when we have experiences, we look at them, we experience them, but we don't have to get locked into them. Very interesting approach. And I know there's some people starting to apply it now to career guidance. Um, I've seen a few pieces come out in books and in the presentation. Another intervention here that I'll talk about, and I'll talk about this briefly, I don't want to take up too much time, is something that my colleagues and I have developed at the, height, at the outset of the, of the pandemic. It's called the Work Interventions Network. And this is, um, at some point I was sitting here in my house which is where I've been for a long time, um, probably in March or early April, I said, my colleagues and I need to do something. We can't just keep writing articles about this. And I contacted nine other people around the country, around the, United, around the world, <clears throat> including colleagues from Israel, from Kuwait, from Portugal. Um, and what we developed was a template. We developed four workshop, we developed content for four specific workshops that we're giving away. We're not marketing this, we, we're not. Um, we do ask the people if they use it, inform us and that they agree to use it and not make changes in it. Um, at least not make changes in the manual, they can make changes in the interventions, of course. These interventions were designed for adults, but they can be very, very useful for young people. If you're interested, please get my email address and write to me and I could send you the manual. But these are workshops where we provide the content um, and if there's a lot of people in your agency, we may be able to provide some training as well. But the four points are planning, exploring, and engaging in the job search, uh, deepening and sustaining relationships. This is different from networking. We wanted to differentiate networking from the need for people to develop real social connections. Fostering social awareness and reducing self-blame captures the critical consciousness piece. And the last one is building emotional resilience and self-care which is kind of the mental health prevention piece. Important point here, we have developed this not for mental health therapists, we have developed this primarily for people who work in 
um, job service centers, places where the where they work with unemployed people. And most of the practitioners there are either career practitioners or paraprofessionals. So we don't assume that people will need to have a mental health background to do these interventions. So the career Can guidance. Can I just ask you there? Would, 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 yes. I mean, do you see that, that that method applies for for young people in schools as well? Is it something that yes. secondary schools, high schools should be developing? These these workshops. Yeah. Yeah, I think they could be used. For, yeah, when we developed them, we thought they were very relevant. Some of the examples in our manual might have to be modified, and I'll get my team to work on that in the next few months. But the actual content would be very relevant for high school students. Yes. And the workshop models. So we provide like three or four pages of an outline and some additional materials and resources for people to run these workshops. And they're based on evidence-based research um, and best practices in our field. So yeah, I think they would be, we haven't used them yet with high school students, but I do think they would be very relevant. I don't see any mitigating factors. Okay. Uh, so the career guidance unemployment linkage in some ways, career guidance people in the high schools haven't had to deal with unemployment that much. You've been helping people get their, get a launch, but now you're going to be working with people who are facing an un, uh, unemployment market that is not very active, to say the least. So you may need to get more into this unemployment world and to realize that some of the main some of the main takeaways I would suggest is to make sure you reduce self blame. That's critical. You know, when students start to blame themselves, try to intervene in that area help to enhance agency initiative, um, which actually could also help if they start to feel depressed. There's a research literature that behavioral activation is a very good intervention for people who are facing depressed moods and anxiety, and then help people to connect to those who can support them and treat them with dignity. So thank you very much. Um, there's my email address and my Twitter, but I know that uh, we have a lot more to cover here. So Anthony, I Appreciate the opportunity to present here. It's really been a lot of fun. Yeah, and I thank you so much, David. Um, I mean, I think a key point that you're getting across here is that we need to help young people um, think and reflect on the kind of the nature of the labour market which they're going to go into. And you know, I kind of showed you in some of those early slides that young people um, overwhelmingly now have very high ambition. Mm -hmm. um, they are you know, as a generation more highly educated than any generation in the history of humanity. Um, and, you know, they're going to be encountering a labor market, which is difficult. Absolutely. One question I had for you was, um, yes. I mean, you know, sometimes I'm tempted to call this generation, you know, kind of generation COVID or the COVID generation, you know, on the thinking that, um, you know, in, um, um, you know, during that connection, we're kind of saying to them, you know, this is not your fault, you know, you're entering a really difficult, you know, unusual pandemic situation, um, you know, you know, you, you know, it's not, it's not to you, you know, you're not responsible for how difficult these things are, but there are things you can do, but we can always need to remember that, you know, this is the situation you've been given. Yeah. Um, but other people say to me that, you know, we should label a generation like that, you know, it's, it's, it's damaging to them. Um, do you have a view? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a, I think, have, have, I mean, my thought is that it help. It helps. It might help to nor to label it. Might help to normalize their feelings about it. It might help them to see the contextual factors that exist, and it might help to reduce self blame. I meet a lot of young people in my teaching, I'm teaching students at Boston College, and I see the, the, the really the, the psychological and career development devastation that they feel frightened beyond measure. They don't want to graduate. Um, they're angry about what happened. Um, it's, it's, it's a, I mean, I have five, a five-year-old grandson who's worried about coronavirus. Four-year-olds know about it. I mean, it is, it is permeated throughout all of our youth and we do have, I think it's important to not scare them um, and to also let the, the young people in high school, for example, know that yes, this is a daunting challenge, but we will get through this. And you know, there may be some difficulties in you making the transition, but in the past, people have gotten through this and many people have done well despite these challenges and most people in fact have done well. So I would try to normalize it. So I think calling them the COVID generation, they'll tell us if they want to be called the COVID generation. <laughs> As we know, they're not, uh, young people are not They're not shy. shy. No. no, no, not shy. Um, thank you so much, David. Um, You're welcome. Did, did you have any, did you have any um, questions or observations you wanted to make on David's presentation before we 
I thought that was brilliant, David. And it just sort of reminds us all, I think, of the time that we're in now is all about well-being and resilience and that all the models that you've shown there are fantastic to help us think about our frameworks and how we create our, our work, you know, in, in frameworks. So uh, thank you so much for that. I've thank just you. said to the audience in the chat, any other thoughts or ideas, you know, do share them because it's uh, great to have that resource. I, I think just I'd pick up maybe on the work with special educational needs and, and um, students with disability. And of course, intersectionality always comes to mind, you know, in that, you know, we're not talking about just a grouping with that label, you know, it takes many forms and many degrees of um, uh, sort of low to, to high uh, learning difficulty. But just on a practical sense, uh, share a story with you. Um, I worked in the school recently, and Anthony will be familiar with this, where, you know, there was an activity that you bring the children together and they draw, you know, a picture of their hopes and their, their dreams. And one of the great things I think about uh, creative applications uh, in careers work is that actually it can be so inclusive. And one of the big points that came from the teaching assistant and from the, the teacher was that that activity was the most inclusive that they felt uh, they'd experienced in some time. Because often the children with special educational needs or disabilities are either put at the back of the assembly or they're taken out of the activity because it's sort of deemed that maybe it's not right for them. So just a couple of practical um, sort of thoughts on that. Um, one, I think if you're a practitioner, surround yourself with expertise, you know, other people who are facing a similar challenge to you about how to design your service and make it really effective. Secondly, pitch real life experience at the right level with the children or the young people. So it's really important to get that preparation right so it's pitched at the right level. Don't be afraid to use digital uh, as well. Um, you know, I think often um, we can see that in some cases for pedagogy, um, digital means are used, particularly with this group, to help um, sort of them connect with the world of, um, of living and learning and, and work. I think the other point I would make is about employers. You know, if you're a careers advisor, you need to prepare the employers well who may be coming into your school, you know, to understand what success will look like around the educational outcomes, you know, of the input maybe that, that they provide. And have lots of visuals, you know, manage that learning visually. And then finally, um, I think we forget sometimes to tell the success stories of the really good career mm -hmm. guidance or counselling work. We kind of come away feeling good ourselves as a practitioner. But I would say there's more to be done around celebrate that success and let's not put young people, children, and adults in that box of well, their special educational needs. So actually, we have to do things so differently, and there may not be opportunities. Because I think um, that looking ahead with technological developments, and we'll pick up on this later. You know, for many um, young people, uh, and I'm talking teenagers and and young adults. You know, there will be ways of earning a living online. Uh, and it has its pluses and its negatives, but we'll come on to that later. But I just wanted to kind of pitch that in as sort of practical, um, don't be afraid of it, um, but just be planful. And maybe those hints and tips from my own experience of working in schools and from what I've read from others. Oh, thank you. Those great points, Deirdre. Excellent points. Really helps to flesh out what I've said and kind of link it to some of the work you're going to do here as well. It's wonderful. Thank, thank you so much. No, um, well, we, 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 we can hear more from Deirdre um, later. And I'm going to formally, I'm going to probably introduce you as well, Deirdre, um, in a little while. Um, I'm going to you can add to David's psychological dimension by adding a, a sociological sort of like dimension. And to recommend as well um, a program which we came across when we were uh, getting our work in this area um, in Finland. Um, called the so like the group um, school to work <coughs> method, and um, it's got a similar it's got some similarities with um, 
uh, exactly the sort of things which Dave, many similarities, what Dave is talking about. Um, it's a program which, and I put the, I put the link there in the, in the chat, there's a program for a week, um, 20 hours, um, the last year of education focused in vocational schools particularly, um, where the, the aim is for young people to kind of explore the labour market, to meet employers, to, um, to review their own um, um, skills and knowledge, um, to um, prepare for the socialisation going into a workplace, um, you know, to, um, to practice some of the group recruitment skills which they'll need. And in, in some of the evaluations, we, we kind of see, you know, kind of a higher, um, you know, economic outcomes for young people. They do better in employment, but also they're psychologically um, in a better place. Um, so I'll just put that, that link down there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of like take 10 minutes to talk to you about some of the work that, that we've been doing, which is about big data and um, I take a psychological perspective. Um, our... I'm the head now of the, the career ready team. And you know, what that does is ultimately we're looking to develop tools based upon big data to help policymakers and practitioners um, uh, make, you know, in, um, um, ensure that um, you know, kind of programs and initiatives are as informed as possible by our understanding about what works. Uh, because it's difficult in this field. You know, we have interventions when kids are teenagers, and then we have to wait, you know, so like three years, five years, 10 years to see if there's any actually impact, you know, do they do better or not, you know, because of the impact on the interventions which we, we make. Well, you know, there is a way of being able to test that. And that's by looking at the data from longitudinal surveys, which follow young people from, you know, the childhood into, a, and ad, into adulthood. And we've been reviewing that literature and also we're going to be doing new analysis of national longitudinal surveys, um, Australia, Canada, China, and so on, you'll see the list there. Um, you know, we're you know, taking insights in terms of, you know, kind of what works, um, what are the statistically significant connections between you know, interventions that young people experience and them doing better than we'd expect later on. And today um, we put this working paper out, this um, sorry, guidance paper, how schools can help protect young people in the recession. It kind of summarizes um, some of the insights we've got from, you know, from this data about what works, you know, what's making a difference. You know, uh, what are the things which young people experience, um, which leads them to doing better in work than we'd expect, given their qualifications and background. Um, so that's, that's available. If you see at the bottom of the screen there, the Career Readiness website, you know, you'll find um, links there, um, um, and um, as I say, so like in October, that's what we plan to kind of present our data-driven tools. And we're going to be working with David and Deirdre, among, amongst many others, in, um, in trying to make that happen. Um, I'm going to share with you some of our provisional indicators. And in doing so, um, I'm kind of like answering some of the questions um, which we've had. Um, Ursula and Ama from Ireland have been thinking about 21st century skills, transferable skills. Ed, hello Ed, hope you're feeling better in the United States uh, about should schools be encouraging students to volunteer? So I'm going to be touching on some of these questions which we've had. Um, now, the first, the first thing is what you, what you see here is um, um, uh, basically indicators which we've picked up through a, so like a very thorough review of literature and new analysis, which we've done ourselves, which looked at these kind of big data sets where you follow these young people from childhood into adulthood. You know, are they doing better than you would expect given their qualifications and social backgrounds? Social backgrounds, you know, kind of the gender, the social status, the migrant status, you know, these are things which often sort of like distort how well people do in the labour market. Well, we can control for that statistically. And then what we find is that Across three different areas, you know, there are, you know, um, across different countries, different time zones, we find these significant relationships. And if you look at that paper on the right, if you go there, that's where you'll find, you know, these studies, you know, described in, in detail with links to all the studies, and you'll be able to um, kind of follow up um, in your own time. But let me just run through some and pick out a few things which I think might be of particular interest. Um, career uncertainty. You know, if a young person is unable to name a job they expect to do at 30, in general, they do worse later on in the labour market than we'd expect. Um, particularly if they're kind of like lower achievers, particularly if they're from more disadvantaged social backgrounds. Um, and, you know, similarly, um, we kind of find that, you know, when uh, young people do sort of name their ambitions, um, higher levels of ambitions, we kind of saw all those young people. And it's a bit, it's, you know, it's kind of a bit problematic. We saw all those young people wanting to be managers or professionals going to universities. Well, high ambition does pay off. 
you know even if you end up even if you're going through a vocational route you know that's what we're finding um, perhaps the most in, interesting and this is actually kind of like a very simple test you know kind of this idea about career misalignment if young people underestimate the education they need for a job goal we can ask students you know what do you expect to do what sort of job do you expect to do you know in your 20s or 30s you know how much education do you plan to get if you underestimate that we find across a series of studies that you do worse in the labor market than we'd expect and it speaks to this career confusion you know these are simple questions which we can ask young people which give us an insight into you know the extent to which they are really are thinking about the future and similarly around exploring the future you know it's you know, it's remarkable but we find you know, strong evidence that simply having a conversation with an adult about a job of interest makes a difference and that's that goes back to what david was talking about in terms of this you know exploration this preparation this um you know this kind of you know kind of what was, what was the phrase deepening the kind of the um relationships which young people can have you know by how yes. we'd encourage them to have multiple conversations and you know people might think that well, it must be 98%, 99% of kids have these conversations, but that's not the case. You know, kind of PISA and other studies tell us that it tends to be about three quarters and the kids mm. who have conversations tend to be the ones from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, the lower achievers, the one they're going to go into work early. And so we kind of find that when they're exploring the future, you know, whether it's a, a you know, kind of a vocationally focused program of occupational exploration, if it's um, career development activities, this act of exploration is associated with doing better later on. And then thirdly, we've got this area around experiencing the future. And again, we find, you know, teenagers who work part time, teenagers who undertake internships or work placements, teenagers who volunteer. And it's, you know, all of those are related with better outcomes. And it's not to say that, you know, these are the the golden key, the golden bullet, which is going to be able to resolve, you know, all the problems. It means that through this process, we're giving them, we're giving them uh, uh, important information and experience, which they can actually use kind of in the labour market. And so these are simple things I think sort of like schools can do. Ask young people, you know, are they thinking about the future? Are they exploring the future? Are they experiencing the future? And our PISA data tells us that often, often they're not. Um, um, I want to show you first though you know, kind of like the way that some of these things interact. And so what you've got here is uh, basically we're pulling together our data across the OECD countries about the relationship between um, you know, uncertainty, misalignment and career conversations. And so we can find here that if a young person says, yes, they've talked to an adult, they've talked to somebody about a job they like, they're much less likely to be uncertain. They're much less likely to be uh, misaligned. Now, it might not be cause and effect, it might not be that that information made them certain, that information you know, you know, cleared up the confusion, but it's an indicator for us that they're kind of taking some active ex ex exploration, investigation themselves. They're taking some agency over where they're going. Um, I was asked about um, volunteering, and volunteering is really important these days because in many countries, part-time working is drying up for teenagers. You know, teenagers tend to focus on their academic studies, but also with automation, a lot of the semi-skilled, skilled jobs that teenagers would do are disappearing it's not always the case but we can see it where we see it often and um, volunteering is a way of giving young people access to the labor market access to real workplaces and um, possibly this is easier to give them access to um, a, an area of the labor market they're actively interested in and you've got that list of um, you know kind of articles you know down the left hand side of the screen these are pieces over the last three years which have used you know, longitudinal data to show that young people who volunteer do better later on than you'd expect. And one of those particularly, um, the piece by Kim, you know, she's got data which allows her to, uh, um, to see if the kids um, you know, were made to do the volunteering or they, they chose to do it. Because if the, you know, because it kind of says something about the motivation, maybe something about the psych psychological uh, positioning of the kid. Um, she finds no difference. It's the actual the experience of being in a workplace that really does make a difference. And from some of the work that we've done, what we've seen is that, you know, kids who don't work part time, you know, actually get much bigger impacts from from work experience placements. And so it's, you know, it, 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 it's, it's possible that we can um, we can we can use these different interventions as a way to create a profile for a young person to give them an opportunities to you know, kind of really experience that workplace first hand. And what does this mean? Well, 
this kind of links to those questions about um, transferable skills, adaptability. And that's one of the key things which um, you know, schools are being um, uh, encouraged to try and in integrate um, into learning. You know, we're going to know that, you know, kind of this 21st century labor market with automation and technological change, you know, it's the job of life, you know, the, the, you know there's no job for life, it's the life of jobs, you know, people need to be able to adapt to different circumstances, quite hard to do. But what we find is that, you know, kids who work part time, volunteer and, and take internships, you know, are significantly more likely to agree that they can deal with unusual situations. They can adapt to different situations, even under stress or pressure. They are capable of overcoming difficulties and interacting with people from other cultures. And this is important because you might look down here and see, you know, there's not a great big difference. But, you know, we don't know whether, you know, they're, um, we don't know much about whether part time work. We don't know if they do, you know, um, intense part time work over a period of time. It makes a, a much bigger difference of volunteering. The fact that it does at all shows us that this sort of experiential learning is really positive for young people. It kind of gives them the opportunity to be kind of personally effective in a new situation. It teaches them something you know, new and useful. And so, um, you know, in, 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 in the, in, as, as we can prepare young people um, and think about how we can prepare them for going into this labor market, we need to think about their school years as kind of like a safe environment for them to test out themselves you know, in, these, in, 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 um, um, in, in, in the workplace. And, yeah, so like finally, I want to just like show you some um, some figures about um, uh, the extent to which the percentages of 15 year olds who say that they've been taught how to do an interview. Um, uh, and we're going to see quite a lot of variation and we don't know an awful lot about the quality of it. But what we do know from you know, the, the few studies which look at interviewing, and I'm sure many people here will have first-hand experience of it, is that you know, kind of kids who take part in sort of like mock interviews, and that's something which we can do sort of like, you know, virtually, so like online, um, um, you know, they get a great opportunity to reflect upon you know, their education, their accumulation of learning and knowledge and skills, and start thinking about you know, whether there are gaps, whether they're sort of well-suited, whether it's something which is, is um, what the pathways are, and they can learn an awful lot in quite a short period of time. And there's a link here to a, a, a publication, which, um, which I was involved in a few years ago, which I think provides some very useful tips. Now, um, I'm gonna sort of like uh, kind of pause there, and at this time invite, David and Deirdre to, uh, to ask me if they've got any um, sort of comments um, or any, anything which they wanted to, any questions they wanted to highlight before we moved on. I did have a suggestion, a thought about the volunteering. <clears throat> I think volunteer, and I do this, I've done this with adults as well, and I think it's really essential for young people. I think that volunteering is optimal if it does, and I know we've, you've touched on this, if it provides skills, um, but I think even if it doesn't provide actually new, like marketable skills, if it if we can conceptualize it as providing ways to enhance social and emotional skills, um, and also helping people to feel like they're making a contribution, there's a lot of dimensions in which volunteering is useful. <clears throat> I know in the U.S. there's been a debate about we 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 kind of call this in, this volunteering internships, unpaid internships. There's been a big debate in the U.S. that that has privileged wealthier people, whose families can afford to have them do one paid work. So um, there's actually some discussion here in the US of, of having some payment for these unpaid internships to reduce the, the inequity. I don't know if that's a conversation outside of the US, but I just wanted to throw the two ideas out. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there tends to be a bit of a difference between things which are in school um, and out of school. Um, and certainly stuff like uh, there's a big issue about unpaid internships for, uh, mm -hmm. for, for adults or for you know, people, people over the age of 18 in, in, in many, many countries. I mean, often, you know, if, if it's a if it's a, um, um, if, it's a um, if it's in the real world, like the old world, we actually physically travel somewhere where you mm -hmm. have to pay for your lunch, then, you know, there are costs there. And we would hope that, um, you know, kind of schools and um, employers and people who are part of, you know, kind of the mechanism by which people get the young people gain the experience are, 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 are open and, and, and realise that, mm -hmm. you know, these costs, even though they're a small, can be, can, be, can be very real barriers. That's right. And actually in school, it's a kind of different story than we'd be thinking about it as work-based learning. Mm. And that, that, that would be a little bit different from if they were not attached to the school. Yeah. 
We've got a question so from, from uh, an observation from Frederick about uh, yes. you know kind of volunteering and work experiences being so difficult during the pandemic. And I guess there's a couple of things. There's one is that we're looking forward now to a period where you know the constraints will be less. Um, you know, but the kind of the, the implications, the consequences of the pandemic economically are still going to be very much felt. But we're very interested in we're, we're investigating examples of virtual um, work experience. Um, I would ask, you know, if anybody here is joining us today feels that they've got, um, you know, kind of good, you know, um, good examples of online work experience or volunteering, which they feel they can share. Um, let us know. You know, we want to write them up and share them because we kind of realise that you know these these you know there, there are barriers, but also there are opportunities here. Um, you know, kind of the online system actually sort of like covers um, it makes things much easier for people in rural communities, for example. Um, Anthony, sure. I have a question linked to this. So we have been receiving many comments in, in the chat, not so many questions, but there's a comment from Janice, very related to what you're saying about volunteering in COVID. She's saying that pre-COVID, her students would have had the opportunity to participate in career shadow, shadow days and would have also had professionals come into the school and speak with the students to share the knowledge about their professions. But this is, hasn't happened anymore. So the question would be, what can be done about that in the context of COVID? Okay. This actually might be a good time to bring you in, Deirdre. Yeah, sure. Like I um, think well, let, let, let me just tell people, let people know a little bit about you. Um, uh -huh. If you haven't come across Deirdre before, and I bet a lot of people have, um, Deirdre's been working, uh, Deirdre and I first kind of like worked together on a, on a really important literature review about career education um, uh, and for the, uh, uh, you know, kind of for the Education Endowment Foundation, uh, kind of in the UK. Um, uh, but Deirdre advises governments around the world on career guidance. Um, she is one of the key editors for the, the British Journal for Guidance and Counselling. Um, Deirdre, um, has um, got huge um, sort of like, uh, influence, I think, in the kind of the policy domain, I would say. Um, but also she's got lots of experience as a practicing careers advisor and is very sort of like close to kind of like practice. Um, so Deirdre, um, there's a couple of questions already for you to think about um, how you might respond. Also, I just wanted to throw you away um, questions from Andrew. Hello, Andrew. Haven't seen you for years and years. Um, who asks, um, what should be the key characteristics of effective career-related learning at primary school. Um, Tom from Ireland asks about ICT in guidance, which relates to what we were just talking about. Peter from Scotland asks, you know, how can we contextualize subject learning to enhance career learning? So there's a, a few questions for yeah, you, um, but did you take it away? Oh, well, thank you ever so much, Anthony. And um, it's just fantastic uh, to have this conversation, really. Um, we were talking about it, we want it to be more of a conversation than just step by, by PowerPoint. So uh, my PowerPoints are probably slightly longer than David's or Anthony's, so uh, I'm guilty. Um, I think all I wanted to say on the discussion about um, volunteering and part-time work is like, I do want to congratulate the OECD for actually surfacing these topics now, because we are on this cusp of change. Um, you know, when we come out of the pandemic, um, you know, the world of work as we've previously known it and school to work transitions are going to be very, very different. Some will be the same, but some will be very, very different. So, like, I think we need to have more of these conversations and debates amongst ourselves and with colleagues about, you know, volunteering and, and part time work, because um, just briefly, I grew up in Northern Ireland in the Troubles. And I lived on an estate where most people had no jobs and didn't know anyone who went to university. Um, and so that line of sight to opportunity, you know, was really quite um, difficult for many people. And some people find it easy to get into a job and others it took longer. So I do think, you know, these topics of resilience, these topics of what will the opportunity structure look like? That's what's so exciting about the work that you and your team are doing, Anthony. So I, I really welcome, welcome that. Um, I would say that um, if I hadn't had voluntary work experience, maybe I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today in a way. So, you know, you get good and bad in everything. And I think as a careers practitioner, um, we have to really genuinely look at um, what, what can we do to open up the world of opportunity in a way. 
I'm going to just very briefly share a few slides and respond um, to that which was just um, just asked. So hopefully you can see my slides okay. Yeah. Anthony said that uh, today's session be like a jazz ensemble. And um, so I've got the band, I've got the piano behind me here, um, but I'm not going to play any music. The music I'm going to play is around um, thinking about those serious questions um, that were asked. So I think, first of all, um, I, I picked up this quote from uh, Buddy Rich because I think, like everything in life, whether you're a researcher, a policymaker or a practitioner, you only get better the more you practice at it. And I think for all of us, we're all learning every day. We learn about a new theory or a new way of doing things. And I think that's what's great about this Ask um, an Expert. I want to learn from you as well as you may be learning from me and David and Anthony. Um, I see the situation at the moment as a, a kind of world of two halves, really. Um, on the right hand, we know the right hand side that COVID will end soon. I'm in Devon, uh, famous for cream teas uh, and scones and jam. Um, uh, and I've been in lockdown for about a year. But like we do know with the vaccination now that there's light at the end of the tunnel and we will have happiness, you know, to be reunited. But I think as David has said, we are actually going to find that the consequences of COVID, particularly on young people's mental health and well-being, and their beliefs about the opportunity structure that's available to them, is something that we are going to have to make huge efforts in um, addressing. Um, so it is a tale of, of, of two halves, and I don't think any of us really know the full scale of what that health and well-being um, and mindsets of young people will be affected by COVID. So, um, you know, this is what um, it's been like wherever you are in the world. If you're a careers practitioner, your world would have looked like, um, you know, your group work and your one-to-ones. And uh, spoke to someone today who's responsible for mass testing in a college, and he's tearing his hair out. Um, because uh, there's just so much to do and so much pressure and not a lot of time for really planning what a really good curriculum for careers is going to look like. So there are challenges, but I think pressure can work really well for us. And I often use this little image of um, if we can find the right um, models and the right intervention, then actually to be able to find that sweet spot of what will work locally in a, a local school or what will work online it's really important and pressure can work for all of us so i think we are in a situation now with events like today where we the more we share with each other the more resources we can share the more ideas then we'll be better equipped to hit, hit that what i call that sweet spot um i'm going to quickly skip over this because you know you all know about strategy but you know, in answering uh, Andrew's question about the characteristics of um, sort of career related learning and, and primary, like, first of all, I think we have to be clear about the strategy, you know, why are we doing it? Um, exploring these challenges that the organisation faces, choosing the ones to focus on because we can't do everything, thinking about the what, you know, the, the principles of the policies that are going to define your approach and then the, the how. And I'm a great believer in that you can't eat an elephant all at once. So you've got to work out, you know, your priorities and how you're going to do things. And I see very much whether you're doing careers work in primary schools or whether you're doing it in elementary schools, or post primary schools. Good careers work is about having a safety net for people, providing a safety net and places and spaces for people to go where they can get skilled help. And it's simplest for me, that's really what drives um, much of the work that I do and indeed many of the professionals, uh, including David and Anthony um, as well. So let's answer the question, Deirdre, I hear you say, Anthony. Um, so uh, key characteristics, good work in primary schools. Um, I'll give you um, a couple of links to um, some studies. Um, one is an international literature review, um, which was funded by um, a teaching organisation called Teach First with education employers here in London, uh, in the UK. 
And in fact, there's at least three UK evidence-based studies, um, which I'll give you links to. But look out for a special issue that's coming out soon on childhood learning, um, early childhood learning, a British Journal article. So for me, the key characteristics, and I've got a little image here of a project I'm involved in in Derby in the East Midlands. Um, it's a city in the East Midlands, and I'm working in seven of the most deprived wards um, with 32 primary schools. And this is a little drawing of which there are over a thousand drawings uh, from the children. So what have I learned about the key characteristics? Well, I think, first of all, what I have learned is that we must start early um, in primary school because those are the foundations of the construction of your identity, influenced by your family, influenced by your teachers, influenced by um, context. Um, and I think there's three things really. Um, maybe just before I say the three, just to say that career related learning is all about uh, knowledge about the world of, of work, but also your skills for life and, and for well-being as well. So the studies I've been involved in have shown that one, it's all about focusing around learning and educational outcomes. So for example, a characteristic can be around literacy and numeracy and how in a way the careers related work can act as a supplement to that to strengthen it and help in terms of um, attainment uh, in the classroom. Or it can be just a complementary mechanism to develop the students' attitudes, their self-belief and their, their, their skills. So that, that's one. I think the focus really on enhancing and expanding children's um, knowledge um, of the world of work is really important. And just very quickly to, to give you an idea that children from um, the study I've been involved in, the, the findings really resonate with international work, which Anthony was involved in early on, but also education employers through their, their work have been involved in. And that is that the children commonly have a very narrow range of occupations. And then secondly, the characteristics um, of all of this is that um, we have to find a way of opening up those and so an essential part is to bring role models into the school. So the schools that I've worked in, um, one of the other findings was that we um, sort of find that there was a lot of unconscious bias in the children. Um, and these are children from the age of uh, six uh, right up to um, 10. Um, so I, I think, um, you know, the question is then, how do you tackle our unconscious bias? So unless we bring role models into these schools, then I think um, what we're going to find is that particularly in neighbourhoods where employers have had mass redundancies because of COVID, if these children are influenced by their parents and their parents are unemployed, we're almost setting up the conditions for this intergenerational unemployment, which we must must avoid. I think the other thing really, so it's all about expanding their, um, their, their knowledge, tackling gender stereotype and illustrating how your subjects are relevant uh, to a, a world of work, which then leads to, to sort of motivation. And I, I think we've got uh, someone from Skills Builder here. We used a Skills Builder framework to find out from the kids after you had a careers intervention, you know, um, did, did it help? And it was so interesting, the children said talking in front of the class was something that they did least uh, of all these activities. But it was good to see that when you have someone come into the classroom and you have these role models that work closely with teachers, that actually we could see that there was significant difference. And of course, variations in ethnicity. So a lot of the, um, the, the literature around um, making context relevant and multiculturalism uh, as well, really important. And I suppose the other thing um, I would say just on the uh, primary characteristics is let's not forget about enterprise because sometimes enterprise is seen as a bit of a dirty word. You know, you're, if you're not entrepreneurial, this kind of 
assumption sometimes that people think people who talk about enterprise means everybody has to be entrepreneurial, which of course they, they don't. But there are some interesting studies in both the uh, Teach First report on the international literature and um, another sister project for the Careers and Enterprise Company that will give you some ideas of if we can find ways. And Miller, for example, did a study in 2017 on enterprise activities and basically found that they can actually help children develop the right attitudes around resilience and the things that David um, spoke about and the qualities of adaptability, you know, perseverance, etc. So I think on the characteristics for primary schools, um, it has to be creative. It has to be really, really relevant. And I personally think that primary schools do this easier than elementary schools or, or post-primary schools because the way in which the curriculum here in the UK um, it is designed. So that's the sort of, if you like, the, the primary piece. Um, uh, maybe just quickly move on to, uh, let's look at sort of post-primary. So a big challenge I would put into the discussion here, whichever part of the world you're in, is that if children are doing career learning in primary, how are you capturing that? and then helping inform the teachers who are the recipients of the cohorts of new students. So again, we've been developing a career log, which I'm very happy to share as part of the resources that can go online, that will go with the child into the school about their hopes and their aspirations. And I think, to, um, Anthony, that plays in well, you know, to what you were saying about, you know, if there's misalignment there, we actually need to know what the starting position was around capturing their hopes and dreams. And then just, just briefly, um, I have great privilege in working with two fantastic academics who sadly are no longer with us, um, Bill Law and uh, Franz Myers. And I think what I learned um, really from the work uh, with both of them was that we do have to create this learning environment. Bill Law talked about sensing, sifting, focusing, understanding as a framework, that we've got to help young people think about getting the picture of you know, the relevance of what they're studying to a world of work through conversation. And so I think from some of the work that I've been directly involved in in schools is that um, it has to be sort of practice driven instead of theory driven. Like it has to resonate for the students and often the teachers are so preoccupied with stretch of having to do so much. So I think we have to get better at that. How can we create real live projects that the teachers enjoy and that the students enjoy and that actually that brings learning uh, to life. I suppose the other point would be that, you know, um, dialogue is important and education needs to be more sort of dialogical uh, in its nature. And again, what that means is what are the stories that we can capture from the young people about their hopes, their dreams, and use different techniques. Um, this is a free resource that I've got from a great book called Career Coaching, which again, I'll share um, with you. As a practitioner, you know, how can you get that story going where the student feels that they can share some of their most inner thoughts with you, their fears and their worries? And there's some practical uh, ways you can do that using metaphors, you know, if you're in a river on this side and you want to get on that side, you know, uh, what are the steps that you need to take? So I do think we have to um, be much more creative, perhaps more creative writing, um, perhaps that stronger sort of link to education has to be practical and real for young people in terms of imagining what the future might look like. And dare I say it, that might include unemployment as well. What would you do if you haven't got a job? How would you occupy your time? What opportunities are there? 
And then, you know, I always bang on about places and spaces. Um, those of you who know me, but I do think that you have to give space, you know, for students to have their say in decision making when it comes to the form and the content of their learning and their personal development. And maybe with COVID-19 forcing um, more students to be self-sufficient and use technology at home for those who can, maybe actually we're going to find that students are going to become even more um, sort of demanding around if it's not relevant to what they really uh, feel that they, they need or their interests, then that'll be tricky. And now I'm going to pause, Anthony, um, but just to say that in this audience across the world, the people who are here, everybody will have a framework of some sort that they use uh, for careers work. I've just put this up as one illustration. Um, it, it came from a project I was involved in in the Black Country, which again, an area of, of high unemployment. And it touches, Anthony, and all the things that you've said in your publications, you know, about experiences and exposure to the world of work, how much is enough? <laughs> you know, here was the idea of every young person had 100 hours work experience um, of some kind, and that would be better than nothing. Uh, and that was an idea from London, London Ambitions. But I, I won't read out all the bits here, but... I think frameworks can be quite helpful around, um, you know, looking at the elements in career guidance, career counselling, career education, and then, you know, the framework that you're going to develop on indicators, Anthony, is really fantastic because it will help people look at the sort of how do we measure and, as you said, how much is enough. I'll pause at that point and I can come back on technology when you're ready. That's great. Thank you so much, Deirdre. That's really good. I, I kind of noticed that we're, um, um, we're, we're only got our last 10 minutes now. So I'm going to pause here and ask Catalina if we've had uh, other questions which have come in through the discussion. And then that will give you and David and myself opportunity to have a few sort of like concluding words as we, as we kind of wrap up. But um, thank you so much. I think career dialogue is really important. And I think that's something which we will want to sort of spend some work on because there's ways of doing it where you can get more out of it. And that mm -hmm. to everybody in a school and everybody in a community, not just a careers professional. But Catalina, um, mm -hmm. have we thank had you. other questions and observations as we've been going through? Well, there has been many, many comments. I'm just going to pick a few of the questions. So there's a question from Filomena for Deidre. So she says that the ability to project oneself in the future is key for career, but that even before the pandemic, anticipating what the future would look like, especially concerning work and careers, was not a simple thing to do. And this has only become worse with the pandemic. So a question for you is, how do you think this can be achieved? Then there were also several comments and questions about how parents do not seem to like VET or they do not seem to like apprenticeships. And this influences then what the student think. Then I'm going to put together some questions that we received when Alison from the UK and Aaron from Scotland registered. And the question for everyone, not only for Deirdre, is what specific groups are in most need of support in the context of COVID? So is it minorities, vulnerable youth, youth with special needs or disabilities, for example? And what good examples of career guidance could you provide for working with these specific groups? And a final bunch of questions have to do with how should we be doing things differently in the context of COVID? So for example, Liam from Ireland was asking, are there any suggestions for ways to encourage young people to switch on their cameras during online counseling sessions? This is a very specific That's question, but it has to do with how do you deal with doing this in a different context? And can virtual guidance ever be as good as face-to-face -face support? So good luck with these questions. Thank you. Wow. A lot there. Um, <laughs> a lot there, yes. Um, do, you want, do, you want, do, you want, do you want to pick and choose a couple? Um, there's something about, um, you know, delivery of services um, online, which I know something you're thinking about a lot. Uh, but, you know, you kind of like take, it, take, take your choice. It's, it's all super valuable, um, what you've been um, um, sharing with us this afternoon. Well, I, I, I'm happy to pick up on the one about labour market intelligence and the labour market and, you know, as a careers professional, if you didn't know what the jobs of the future were, you know, before, and now we've got COVID layered on top of it, you know, um, often there are 
nice layers, as I call them, you know, who say, oh, well, careers advisors aren't much good because you don't know what the future of the work is. And how can you advise someone if you don't know what the job is? And I think um, uh, I'm often reminded of crumbles, you know, around a butterfly and the trying to uh, hit a butterfly with a, a boomerang. It's a total misunderstanding of what really good career development and good guidance is about. So what I would say is um, there's exciting opportunities now, I think, um, with this kind of reboot of what the labour market look like. So I see opportunities for crowdsourcing labour market information amongst practitioners in cities and in areas. That's something I'm looking at. I also think that... Um, we shouldn't be afraid of that. Um, we don't know what the world of work is like, but we know the skilled helper principle of we are there to help support individuals with their learning about themselves and their learning about the opportunity structure. So I say, don't worry about that. Just have your, your argument well rehearsed around um, the connectivity to the opportunity structure David said advocacy is really important, and I totally agree. And I'd like to follow up on the question about apprenticeships. And uh, I think this actually speaks to the need to get parents involved in career guidance. I know we speak a lot about that in our profession. It, it's a kind of become axiomatic that we get parents involved. But right now, the world of work is going through massive changes. And actually, another project I'm working on is, a, is visioning what the new world of work should look like. This is a big project I'm starting we're trying to rebuild work. I think we're at a juncture point in our society where we can start to rebuild some of the institutional foundations of work. You know, I know it's a bit of a grandiose idea, but we are seeing some room for social change where we hadn't seen it a year or two ago. This does relate to this issue of apprenticeships. I think that um, we all need to think about issues around status and how status is, is designated. And we also need to understand what kind of work is going to be available. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about AI and robotics. And actually, it's interesting that a small microbe did more to the workforce than any, any intelligence uh, AI in the world. So I think that we don't quite know what the world of work is going to look like. But I do think that denigrating and, and dismissing um, trades and um, construction and work in you know, realistic type occupations is a big mistake. And I think this does, is gonna involve some education of parents and families. Um, I do see this a lot when I work with um, people from overseas from different cultures and also in the US that there's a very internalized sense of what a high status career would look like. And unfortunately it doesn't always include the kind of things that some of the students might wanna do and moreover, it doesn't include some of the things that our society needs. So in that context, I do think that um, we should do more education. And also is to point out the example of Germany, which you know has made apprenticeships sound like going to Harvard, uh, which is one of the coolest reframes in the world. It's harder to get into some apprenticeships in, in Germany than it is to get into the best universities. So I think there's ways we can re-message this. And I think it's a really important um, task for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I would argue there that the, that the really important thing is to allow a young person and those around them who are gonna um, help advise them um, to see the, the occupation at the end of the period of training. Mm -hmm. So what it's like to um, you know, run your own salon, what it's like, you know, what are the opportunities which come with um, um, the skilled trades? And you know, often it's, it's a matter of being able to run your own enterprise at a young age. You know, mm -hmm. often like freedom, often it's about maybe like working outdoors. There are all sorts of things which are very good about it. And, you know, it's one of the areas, and we have a whole, a whole section on this in the career ready working paper, uh, because it's young people's ideas about um, the school trades are really heavily distorted by their social background. And so, very much so. you know, reasonably, because you know, people might feel that, you know, they're hostile working places to certain people with certain characteristics, but often it's, about, it's based on ignorance. And mm -hmm. I think we can really need to make sure that, you know, when young people are given the opportunity to, you know, to follow a certification education, it's not just, do you want to do this course? It's mm -hmm. of course as a gateway to, you know, kind of exactly. an identity. How would that sit with you? Yes, it's a great point, mm -hmm. Anthony. Great question. Anthony, one of the questions was about uh, a real practical question. I think it came from um, uh, Peter in Scotland about how can we contextualize subject uh, teaching to enhance 
uh, career learning. Uh, we've not got a lot of time, but just to say that I will share some links um, and, you know, examples, you know, New Zealand have got something called Subject Matter. Um, it's an online uh, sort of facility where students can go in and match their careers to um, uh, different occupational areas. But there's, uh, I think, a growing amount of really good uh, resources for teachers. Um, there's something called um, Planet Plus posters that are free, that um, you can just click on the link and you can print off a poster. And, um, you know, they're, they're good quality. Um, so so there's, there's lots of ways in which you can embed um, that, that learning. And maybe that's something for another conversation for us to have, because I think there's like six key steps that you can take, you know, involve your leadership, make sure you're clear about your purpose, make the project real, um, get enthusiasts around it. But most importantly, make sure that the students um, actually are clear about the, the learning outcomes so that they can then use that, you know, in their resume, mail, whatever. But I, I, this, I, I, when I looked at this and thought about it, there are so many resources, uh, even on Facebook, um, Careers Leaders UK, uh, social media, people are using Facebook to share all sorts of brilliant resources now. So there's no short, it's just knowing where to look. What we're going to do is we'll take a bit of time to sort of like collate the, some of the resources we mentioned today. And next week we'll send out um, um, you know, a, a pull together slideshow. Um, which has all the slides which we've had, um, you know, today, but also we'll add in, you know, some other sort of like resource, you know, a, a, you know, a slides with resources which still people might find particularly useful and interesting. Um, um, I mean, we are sort of like running towards, getting towards the end. Um, I kind of, I kind of really have just one last question, which I'm always really curious about. Maybe the end of a session is not the best, best thing, to, best time to answer it, ask it. But I'm going to ask it anyway. I'm really interested whenever I talk about careers, what, young people what you people you know my uh my, my guest today wanted to be when you were kids you know how did how did that play out um, i'm just really curious and so i know we're kind of at the end but um, i'm still really interested and um, um deirdre um what, what was your ambition when you were a kid quickly a nun when i was at primary school I had actually um raised money for children in africa and i decided that i must have been the chosen one then as a teenager, uh, maybe to work in a bank, because I discovered there were lots of handsome men who worked in my local bank, and I thought it might be a good apprenticeship. Uh, and then um, travel. So an air stewardess is what I uh, landed on. But I travel in my job now, so maybe there was something there about travel in my DNA. <laughs> and what about you, David? Yeah, I had two role models as kids that, uh, that, that really influenced me. So early in my life, I wanted to be the fifth Beatle. And uh, the reality is, as we all know, the Beatles didn't need a fifth member. Um, they certainly didn't need me, who I've tried guitar lessons many times and actually had a guitar teacher fire me, even though he needed the money. I think that's a really powerful <laughs> statement. Um, but I really love John Lennon. Deeply loved John Lennon, felt a deep, deep emotional connection to his music. I uh, felt like his music actually had, was suffused with pain in a way that was much more evident than any other music of that era. Uh, and then a little bit later in my uh, adolescence, I became very attached to Robert Kennedy. And I actually, at 14 years old, I worked on Bobby Kennedy's presidential campaign. Wow. Very proud that I did this on my own. It wasn't part of like a group, let's go do this. I found out what to do. I took the bus to the different part of Queens and uh, was so shook up when he got um, killed. And um, interesting in Joe Biden's Oval Office, there's a, there's, a, there's a bust of Robert F. Kennedy. And it reminded me of what Kennedy meant to me. And you could see some of these elements in my career now. I know this builds on Savickas' work of our early role models, but um, you could see my interest in creativity, loving music and writing in a way that I think I hope is creative. And then my social justice passion and my passion to build a better world. So those are two of my aspirations. My mother thought I would be a very good Senator or president, but um, I didn't agree. Uh, and what about you, Catalina? Um, when I was very young, I wanted to be an entomologist, which I think is kind of weird, but we had a huge encyclopedia about insects and I really loved studying them, classifying, learning how they did things. And then uh, later on, I wanted to be an anthropologist. 
and I ended up being a psychologist. So I think there's kind of a common pattern there. So I moved away from insects. Uh, I mean, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, I, I was actually one of those uncertain kids. And I think I paid a, a price for that um, um, later on. I, you know, I spent a couple of years um, unemployed in my early 20s, trying to sort of like find my way, you know, kind of through education and employment. And I think that's sort of like uncertainty. I look back at the sort of indicators which we have, I would have been sort of like a big red flag, you know, to any sort of like good um, you know, career guidance professional, because I didn't have a clue about anything. Um, all right, so I hope you can all see this final slide, um, which has um, a few sort of like immediate sort of like, uh, oh, sorry, a few sort of like immediate links and emails. Um, you know, so you can stay in touch with our work, you know, the Career Readiness Project. Um, we have our own website now. Uh, we have a, a stakeholder mailing list. Um, if you're not on it, um, so email myself or, or Carrie on the team. Um, John on the team is um, interviewing people around the world about um, practice, which, um, you know, kind of like aligns with what we find from the empirical, empirical work of analysis of the data about what works. Um, email me or John. Um, we're also planning to so like interview people under 25 who've been looking for full-time work um, around the world. We can do interviews in English, French, and Spanish. Um, you're all part of our community. Can you help us connect with people? Um, if so, drop us a line. Um, and also, I should just mention, the OECD is doing further work around um, the future of work. Um, you know, it's a really interesting project, um, very sort of like participative. Um, check it out. You can kind of the website there. And please follow me on Twitter. Today was a, a big day for me. I hit a thousand followers on Twitter, so I'm feeling so, you know, very pleased with myself. Um, <laughs> um, I would say that as well, as well as again sending out the, um, as well as sending out the uh, the, the slides, um, the enhanced slides. We're going to make the copy of the whole video available. Um, I think that'll probably be next week that we send you the details of that. Um, I just want to finally thank so Deirdre. Thank you so much for sharing our time today, David. Thank you so much. Catalina, thank you for sort of looking after so like the questions in the comments. Um, Carrie, you did all the hard work of uh, kind of making sure that you know the technology all works. And thank you everybody for being a part of this. We'll do more webinars through the years, through the year. It's a really big, important subject for kind of the OECD and the other international organisations. And we reflect what governments are thinking often. You know, um, I said you know before the um, the pandemic, never before in human history a career guide has been more important, and that's even more important now given the pandemic. So let's carry on working together. Let's carry on sharing things which work. Um, you know, we're in it together. Thank you so much. Thank Have you all. Morning. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Thank you to you too. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. We're getting some nice